Abhijit Dasgupta is the Jong H. Kim Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Maryland. He's been a principal investigator at the Center for Advanced Life Cycle Engineering at UMD for over 30 years. He's an ASME fellow and current chair of the Reliability Technology Working Group in the aforementioned Heterogeneous Integration Roadmap Team. Uh, thank you, Abhijit. Hey, thanks, Rick. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, good uh, good morning, everyone, or afternoon. It's already afternoon my time. Uh, so, I'm going to change tracks a little bit. You guys heard quite a bit about uh, the various design challenges, architectural challenges, uh, and uh, various associated communication-based challenges for triplet-based systems. I'm going to uh, talk uh, mostly about the reliability aspects. How do we make sure that these systems perform fine, not just on day one, but throughout the life cycle as you expose, the, as the users expose these systems to their life cycle conditions, that they'll continue to perform for whatever period they're required to, three years, five years, seven years, depending on the application. Right. Uh, so, of course, chiplet-based systems are very much a part of the HI roadmap, as you heard Bill Chen uh, mentioned this morning, and several several speakers have uh, 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 expanded on that. Uh, and you heard several speakers talk about mechanical, not just electrical design, but mechanical design, thermal design, and so on. Uh, at the root of the thermal and mechanical designs are also reliability. You're trying to make these systems rugged enough and robust enough that they survive the life cycle. So trying to make them reliable is intrinsically connected to that code design uh, ecosystem that you heard about. So before I jump into some more details, I want to briefly acknowledge uh, two co-authors here, Richard Rao and Shubhita Sastrabude from Marvel and Intel. Uh, they are co-chairs with me on the technology working group that Greg just mentioned in the HIR roadmap team. And Bill had mentioned, uh, Bill Chen had mentioned about this also earlier. Uh, um, quite, a, quite a few of the slides that I'll use today are made with help from them. So their materials are uh, embedded within this, this presentation. So let's move on. Uh, this audience doesn't need this background, obviously understand what uh, HI systems are. Chiplets of various kinds are gonna be going to go into HI systems. They're gonna combine various kinds of technologies, either active or passive electronic components, photonic chips, uh, maybe even MEMS and sensors that'll go into uh, your system. So all of these could be co-packaged in the form of various chiplets. And then of course, within the electronic system, you could have digital analog, logic, memory, power, RF, various kinds of subsystems within the electronic systems. And uh, it's not just obviously at the semiconductor level, now you've got to package all of that to, uh, uh, get them into a form where they can now be interfaced with other chiplets and other substrates, uh, getting or onto other wafers, all the way up to subsystems, and then interconnected uh, to full system level. So a lot of packaging, not just semiconductor, uh, assembly, uh, not just semiconductor manufacturing, but obviously a lot of packaging technologies have to go in here. And that's really uh, one of the key differences spanning where we stand, which is the reliability people. Uh, we see a, uh, this partly as a convergence, oops, convergence of uh, different parts of the subsystem of the supply chain, and uh, this has been mentioned by many speakers. The, the, it's been called the desegregation and resegregation, where you're splitting up your monolithic large chip into smaller subchips and or chiplets, and then you are taking stuff that you used to do at the uh, board level and bringing them within the chiplet. So on the one hand, you're desegregating, on the other hand, you're aggregating uh, stuff that you used to do at other levels of packaging are now within the chip. And of course, there's been quite a bit of talk of uh, either 2.5 or 3D versions of these, uh, how you build, up, build these systems up. Uh, uh, of course, that leads to multi-scale and of course, quite a bit of multi-physics kinds of challenges when you think about the reliability aspects and what, what uh, affects the performance uh, over the life cycle. Uh, these images have been flashed up several times. Um, just to lead into my topics, I'm using the same ones for continuity. So obviously what we're talking about is taking these large monolithic uh, chips and, and uh, uh, de uh, uh, desegregating them into, into uh, smaller chiplets 
of, with various functionalities. And we have heard several times today about some of the current, uh, well, recent and current versions of uh, commercial, uh, commercially available uh, technologies here. So um, uh, what I wanted to end this slide with is just to remind you what I want to talk about, and that's the fact that the uh, supply chain for semiconductor level processes and what used to be packaging level processes are now converging, which means the failure mechanisms and the failure modes that used to be handled by designers at different levels of the supply chain are now all converging onto the same level, and you have to consider them collectively and uh, in an integrated fashion. You cannot just pass it over the wall to the next level if all of these are now have to be taken care of in the co-design at the same level. Uh, so uh, this is an old picture. Uh, many of you have seen this. It's just from the YOL roadmap. Already quite dated, 2015. So you see that graph stopped at 10 nanometers. Obviously, uh, technology has marched on beyond, well beyond that. We're now talking perhaps in research labs of two nanometers maybe. Uh, but uh, again, the point is that on the horizontal axis is miniaturization. It's mostly on-chip miniaturization, and uh, that's really more following Moore's law. And uh, the whole talk about in the chiplets world, of course, is the other axis, the orthogonal axis, where we are trying to, uh, where through systems integration, uh, intelligent, customized system integration, we are able to combine uh, multiple chiplets with various functionalities. Again, I've mentioned all of these, RF, power, memory, uh, MEMS, sensors, et cetera. All of that can be combined into, uh, uh, into more effective uh, subsystems uh, that can perform, continue to perform fast, even if we cannot miniaturize quite as much. Not to mention that that kind of system integration allows us to mix different, node, uh, different nodes uh, and therefore there's significant cost to yield advantages. Uh, in the reliability world, we uh, basically look at this as, okay, so you've got all of these different technologies with different possible failure sites and failure locations and failure modes and failure mechanisms under the action of life cycle stresses, many of which can be exacerbated by manufacturing defects uh, or manufacturing variabilities. So hence, of course, it, you also have to take a stochastic view of it. Not all your products are going to fail exactly at the same time under the same stresses. There'll be a distribution of failures based on all of the variabilities of your product and the variabilities of the life cycle stresses that, they, that different products see in the field. Uh, hence, the statistical distri failure distributions. But that is not really the statistics part is not what I want to focus on today. It's really the uh, underlying physics of these failure modes and mechanisms that are causing these failures because at the design and development level, that is what you need control over, right? Uh, so to, in order to do that, the first thing of course you need to know as well, what is your reliability target? How many failures are you willing to allow over how many years? Uh, that's a business decision that depends on mission criticality and the cost of failure, right? So it's a risk cost trade-off. It's a very much a business decision. And uh, depends on your business model, your value proposition. I mean, take a simple thing like automobiles. We use that as a prime example because most of my lifetime, we had automobiles as uh, primary owners. We owned the automobile and all of the electronics in it. If any of it failed, that was my headache, right? I would have to worry about it and I would be pretty upset as a customer. So the electronics that went into my automobile, uh, they had to keep me in mind as an end user or end customer and make sure that they kept uh, uh, my requirements and reliability expectations in mind. Uh, well, in a few more years, all that's gonna change. It's already changed, right? Today, many of us don't own cars. We just call up a Lyft, call up an Uber, call up uh, some service provider, use their car. We don't care when their car dies, as long as it doesn't die while I'm in it, right? Uh, that too, perhaps will change with self-driven, uh, 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 autonomous uh, vehicles that can actually monitor, eventually will monitor their own health. Uh, Uber or Lyft are never going to send me a car that's close to dying. Their self-diagnosis is going to tell them, no, this car goes to the shop for repairs. This car is good enough to send for customer use. And all of those uh, ways in which we manage the business proposition of reliability targets is going to change quite dramatically. Okay, But at the end of the day, the builder of these electronics still has to take a fundamental physics-based approach. The business model may be different, but the fundamental physics of why it fails is not going to change that dramatically. Okay, so uh, 
the reliability activities therefore have to start way to the left, right at the design stage, uh, concept design, architectural design, and then detailed design. So reliability has to be a key aspect of it, not just performance, uh, reliability. That means, is it gonna perform over the life cycle, entire life cycle, that's gonna be key. Manufacturing is, uh, again, a key uh, aspect of it. All of the manufacturing variabilities are what cause early failures, unexpected early failures, infant mortality, or premature failures in the field. So managing the manufacturing process for consistent quality uh, is, is absolutely key. So that, again, especially in structures like we're talking about where the feature sizes are extremely small down to the defect of the material length scale, right? So the manufacturer, man, managing manufacturing quality is, is, I'm sorry, manufacturing quality is gonna be key over there. Uh, then comes this whole notion of testing and qualification. So uh, that's not easy either. There's been all this talk about standardization for chiplets. How, how do you standardize across different vendors, different technologies? Uh, well, the qualification and testing for reliability is gonna be a key part of it. How do you run standardize these reliability tests so that any person X buying chiplets from person uh, Y knows exactly what to expect in terms of quality and reliability, right? So those standards don't completely exist today. And as you scale up that subsystem supply chain, going all the way from a uh, single chiplet to uh, subsystems of multiple chiplets, testing ongoing testing and qualification and verification gets harder and harder, more and more complex. So uh, how do you even know the system has failed? What are the built-in tests? And then how do you introduce resilience and uh, redundancy so that even if there's partial defects and partial failures, the system can continue to perform uh, to some level of uh, satisfaction. So all of those kinds of resilient designs perhaps even self-healing capabilities, in some cases, self-repair and self-healing capabilities. All of those are not completely out of the realm uh, as we look ahead to the future and uh, smart systems uh, that we can build today. Uh, Real-time health management is absolutely key, okay? That's a very intrinsic part of uh, building reliable systems today. We seldom anymore put out complex systems, uh, either electronic or non-electronic, uh, right now, of course, we're talking electronic systems. We seldom put out systems nowadays that don't manage their own health, that don't sense continuously, and to some degree manage their own health. Your laptop is doing it. Your phone is doing it. Every little bit of electronics you're wearing, carrying, using is doing it real time, 24-7. Whenever it's operating, it's monitoring its own health. It's exchanging information with, uh, uh, with the base station and trying to optimize its performance in real time using various AI and machine learning capabilities, optimize its performance to maximize uh, 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 life, a lifetime. So managing health is obviously gonna be a key aspect. You need real-time sensors, you need real-time condition monitoring, real-time decision-making about how do I optimize the performance envelope in order to get the most out of this product and not have uh, sudden death uh, while in operation. A uh, key part of that I already mentioned is the supply chain. Managing that complex chiplet-based supply chain is not at all going to be easy. The old supply chain is dramatically getting reconfigured, partly because of heterogeneous integration of chiplet-based systems. Uh, so reconfiguring that supply chain from, in this case, from the reliability perspective is, is a key challenge that we're dealing with. Uh, so that cradle-to-grave methodology, that means you start all the way from concept design where you're defining your goals and understanding what the application conditions will be, all the way down to managing the health in real time of a fielded product all the way until retiring or death of that product, that cradle-to-grave approach is what today's reliability engineers worry about, right? And uh, obviously, it's highly multi-physics. Uh, uh, you've got electrical performance, you've got thermal performance, you've got mechanical performance, you've got chemical contaminants in the, in the product from your uh, process and uh, chemicals, as well as uh, from the environment. So you've also got chemical degradation issues. Uh, all of that has to be assessed, designed for, and managed by design, uh, uh, not by accident, right? And then, uh, of course, the systems are highly multi-scale. You're going from... Uh, tens of millimeters length scales all the way down to nanometers. 
uh, well into the intrinsic defect scale of all of these materials. So managing the physics, underlying physics across those multiple length scales is not at all trivial. And today's design engineers or reliability engineers uh, have to be able to have to have the tools and the uh, uh, knowledge base to manage all of that. Uh, so uh, let's let's talk about combining some of this in the whole ecosystem, right? So uh, there's a body of knowledge uh, we are going to call that reliability physics. Entire communities of experts that uh, dwell in that domain and generate the knowledge needed for mechanical design, thermal design, electrical design. Uh, of course, if you're talking about uh, high energy particle radiation, communication satellites, or base stations that are out in the open environment. Uh, you've got uh, radiation problems, and I mentioned already chemical stresses. So uh, designing for all of those stresses uh, based on the fundamental underlying fundamental material behavior and failure degradation mechanisms, that's a key part of the reliability physics community. And then from the other side, we when we talk about highly complex systems and how they're performing in the field or in test, uh, we also talk about learning uh, 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 learning how to connect their performance and their degradation to these life cycle stresses, not necessarily through the basic physics, but uh, also by machine learning algorithms, neural networks, and other AI techniques, and uh, using utilizing that knowledge also to uh, not just manage the life cycle of the current product, but also help design the next generation product. So there's a top-down approach based on condition and real-time condition condition monitoring data analytics. Uh, and AI. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, there's a bottom-up approach where you understand the uh, fundamental degradation physics of your product, and then uh, uh, the, in the ideal scenario, both of those uh, collectively feed your digital twins that you can use for real-time life management, which in our book means managing a real-time age meter for your product, in other words, at any given instant of time, based on usage up until that time, you should be able to assess uh, what's the remaining useful life of your product. Are you, uh, have you used up 50% of the life, 80% of the life, 90% of the life? So that's the kind of decision that reliability engineers need to make in real time based on everything they know about the design and the manufacturing and the usage of the product. Uh, there's not enough time to go through all of these charts, obviously. I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, put these up briefly. But the, uh, the purpose of this chart is to just highlight that, yes, the reliability engineer belongs in every step of the product de uh, development, all the way from proof of concept, feasibility, detailed design, and product development, uh, which includes manufacturing, and then qualification, uh, also during high volume production, and ultimately, after it's fielded, monitor the product in real time, uh, listen to the product, uh, hear what it's saying, and then have the artificial intelligence built in to adaptively reconfigure the product performance or, uh, or uh, uh, decide whether the product needs repair or retirement. So all of those kinds of decisions have to be made in real time based on the underlying reliability uh, technologies. So if you briefly home in on this design for reliability, uh, task over here. Uh, there are two uh, key parts to it, two main parts to it. So uh, what's the question we're asking in design for reliability? So if I have a, I want to come up with a, give, a given hardware design, which has to survive uh, my reliability targets for a given life cycle, expected life cycle loading conditions, uh, how do I view this design in that, uh, from that perspective? Well, the two aspects. One is what kind of stresses is this life cycle loading causing throughout my hardware potential failure sites? Which means, again, since it, the system is multi-physics, there's thermal, mechanical, thermal, mechanical, uh, chemical diffusion of uh, harsh chemicals and moisture throughout the product. And of course, electrical design and electromagnetic design for high frequency systems. So uh, that is the multi-physics stress analysis part, and several speakers talked about it today. There are tools available that, if not completely integrated, but at least in, can do individual assessments of one or more of these types of stresses. But that tells you, doesn't tell you enough about how reliable the product is going to be. The most important question is, what do those temperature fields, what do those mechanical stress fields, what do those harsh chemicals or the electrical fields, what do they do to your performance? 
or more importantly, to the degradation of your performance over time. That's the reliability aspect. That is what we worry about. That's the reliability physics people jump in here and try to understand sustained exposure to these kinds of stresses cause what kinds of problems in your semiconductors, what kind of problems in your various packaging aspects, the interconnections, the substrates, all of that, right? So we try to understand the stress margins, life margins, based on that kind of quantitative modeling of failure mechanisms. And then once you've got all that figured out, you have to aggregate up to the system, do sensitivity studies for design for reliability. I won't spend too much time on that. I'd like to instead delve a little bit into this box reliability margins um, and talk a little bit about some of the failure types of failures that dominate in chiplets, chiplet based systems and uh, what's the level of knowledge we have over there. So, of course, what we're talking about is chip package interactions here at various levels. That's uh, CPI stands for chip package interactions. So, uh, as we get to the newer and smaller silicon nodes, uh, well, the CPI issues are increasing. Uh, and the old nodes, like I said, the device and the packaging level reliability issues were treated separately in the older nodes. Uh, but now, with uh, newer nodes and uh, uh, chiplet based design heterogeneous integration, uh, we increasingly have to do co-development of device and the packaging, uh, and that's why the CPI is absolutely critical now. Uh, in, uh, in conjunction with all of that, we've got newer materials, low-key materials that have various kinds of mechanical fragility, interfacial adhesion issues. We've got much more complex, the high-density substrates that have warpage issues because of the many different kinds of chiplets we're mounting on the same substrate. So that needs careful mechanical and thermal mechanical design. We are changing many of our interconnects uh, where you're using solders, they're getting smaller and smaller. You're building up copper bumps. That changes the uh, stiffness of the interconnects and strength. That in turn dumps thermal mechanical stresses back into the RDL layers and the dye active layers. So that causes risks in new areas where we didn't used to have risks, okay? And then the dye itself is of course much more complex in some cases, while chiplets is allowing us to move to smaller dyes, in some cases, we also move to bigger dyes. And the power management, of course, is key. Or some high power dyes, some that are chiplets, some that are lower power. So the power management is a key part of it. But uh, the power management, in turn, decides the thermal, thermal and the thermal mechanical issues, uh, which is the aspect that the reliability person is interested in. Uh, other kinds of metallization also at risk. You've got layers and layers of multi-layer metallization. A lot of potential failure sites over there. We don't have time to go over all of that. But I'm basically trying to explain to you what is the sandbox for the reliability engineer who is responsible to make sure that the designs being developed for these shipless based systems are going to be robust, resilient, fault tolerant, and have sufficient reliability of that to last the entire life cycle. Okay, so this is a this is not my slide. Like I said, many of these slides are borrowed, but these are nice summaries. Yeah, I won't have time to go over all of this, but you'll have access to these slides later on. It's a reasonably nice summary of what are all the various issues where we worry about mechanical, uh, electrical, and thermal aspects of uh, stresses so that we understand their impact on reliability and degradation. So uh, flip chip packaging, 3D die stacks, DSPs, micro bumps, die thinning, uh, all of these have an impact uh, on the product performance, not just because you may get failures in interfaces and, and interconnects, but the stresses that some of these TSVs cause directly into your devices, of course, also change your band gap performance and the semiconductor performance itself can change, right? So, uh, and then now uh, as your interconnect micro bumps get smaller and smaller, you start running into new issues where in the old days, the solder joints used to be, for example, many grains and somewhat isotropic homogenous, uh, on a statistically homogenous uh, over the whole joint. Now we are getting down to single grain because these are so tiny, we're getting down to single grain. And any of you who've dealt with at least tin-based solders or sac solders uh, know that tin is highly anisotropic. And now you've got these solder joints that are highly anisotropic, no longer uh, uh, technology used to model them as isotropic in the old days. Can't do that anymore. Now you have to worry about what kinds of stresses these anisotropic solder joints are going to generate because that has a tremendous effect on the surrounding stress fields, not just in the solder, but in all of the surrounding interconnections and in the RDL layers. So, uh, uh, 
So those are the kinds of failures we worry about, uh, delaminations, fracture, peel, fatigue, uh, 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 then uh, uh, as a result of that, shifts in electrical parameters, electrical performance, or out and out, outright opens or leakage currents or electromagnetic interference and so on. Okay, so, um, uh, so the problem starts all the way from the changes in technology are of course uh, FinFETs and maybe going forward gate all around technologies. Uh, the self-heating effects are gonna be quite a bit different. So at least at the uh, semiconductor level, many of the failure and degradation mechanisms we used to worry about are gonna get more uh, exacerbated. So understanding and keeping, uh, yeah, keeping a handle on those uh, degradation mechanisms has been one of the key activities as the silicon nodes have moved ahead, marched ahead. Then as you start to package it, all of the interconnections, so stresses that you see uh, due to packaging, uh, 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 packaging designs, so trying to understand their effect on all of these redistribution layers and all of the interconnection layers and the uh, copper as well as the solder systems, all of that has become important. Uh, the TSVs in turn that I mentioned, they cause stresses in the semiconductors themselves. And as you get to very, very small feature sizes up until about 10 nanometers, they were okay. But now people are talking about how these TSV induced stresses are starting to affect semiconductor performance. So that's also something that uh, uh, we're starting to worry about. Uh, I think you're starting to get the picture. Interest of time, I'll move on. But uh, our job, the reliability physics people, our job is to dive down deep one mechanism at a time, one failure site at a time, understand what the key limitations are of the design under the life cycle stresses, and make sure that the project can endure it and survive for the given life cycle. So uh, uh, this is a slide I stole from the HI Heterogeneous Integration Roadmap team. This is from the Modeling and Simulation uh, uh, Technology Working Group, which is a sister working group to us. We are the Reliability Technology Working Group. This is a sister working group. So they are the ones who are worrying about all of these thermal, mechanical, chemical, electrical simulations, board level, package level, device and chip level. So uh, uh, their job is to make sure that the ecosystem, the modeling ecosystem develops over the next so many years to have all of these tools available in a seamless integrated manner to the system, uh, package designers or chiplet designers. And uh, so all of that co-design has to happen hand in hand. The multi-physics, multi-scale modeling and simulation tools have to be able to catch up with all of that. So here are a few examples. There are some, these are rather rudimentary compared to where we need to be. But you can see that it's, it's already happening. There are various tools. This one is a slide stolen from ANSYS. So thermal analysis, electrical analysis, thermal mechanical analysis, coupling them all back and forth so they're all talking to each other, uh, uh, integrating the analysis so it's seem more seamless. Uh, data flow across these analysis tools have to become uh, easier. So all of that work is going on in the background. That was ANSYS. This is Mentor Graphics. Similarly, uh, feature scale, die scale, packet scale, all the way to subsystem level, uh, uh, all of these tools are slowly developing and growing in sophistication. So that's for the stress analysis. Now the point is due to all of these stresses, temperatures, mechanical stresses, uh, 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 harsh chemical distributions, moisture distributions, what is the failure at individual sites, right? What is the time to failure at individual sites or design margins? So this chart, I know you cannot read it. This is also taken from our twig in the HI roadmap. And uh, I'll just tell you in words what it has. It has the various failure, expected failure modes and mechanisms, each of which have detailed studies and material models and uh, time to failure models. So device level, interconnect level, subsystem and module level. And then the multi-physics is on the other axis, electrical models, thermal models, moisture-driven failure models, thermomechanical models, and so on. So uh, these are sort of trying to capture all of this body of knowledge we're trying to talk about, trying to capture them all on master charts so that we can keep tabs of, okay, which ones have reached what level of maturity as this technology, HI technology, keeps marching on. So this is uh, taken from Richard Rowell. I acknowledged him in the beginning. This is, he's tried to make up a simplified view of uh, what's our status, in some places, we have reasonably well-developed models in place uh, that are in various design tools. So those are in dark green. 
and then light green needs more, more work, and yellows are areas where we need a lot of work. So you can see failure models, failure mo understanding of failure modes, stress analysis tools, and on the other is the other axis is the length scales, wafer level, package level, uh, and the interactions. Right. So this slide is taken. I'm almost at an end. Uh, this slide is taken from my uh, uh, other colleague on this team, uh, uh, Shubhada from Intel. So she works within Intel for knowledge-based qualification of systems, customized qualification tests. So in the world of chiplets, that's going to be very important. How do you standardize chiplets tests and at the same time be able to customize the test for different design uh, applications as well as different technologies. So uh, she uh, is working in our team trying to uh, put all of that information together. And uh, this is a huge problem. How do you design, uh, design built-in tests to know when systems have failed in reliability tests? How do you standardize that information so when you pass it on to the next level of the assembly, they know exactly what test you ran and what the vulnerabilities are? They can quantify those for reliability assessment purposes. So this is a huge task of putting all that body of knowledge together. And that's going to happen, obviously, continue to develop and grow over years. So this is my final slide summarizing everything. So it starts all the way from understanding reliability physics, putting that into your design tools, managing your manufacturing process, the qualification and verification testing process, uh, in-field sustainment, that's prognostics and health management, and then managing your supply chain. And at the end of the day, uh, understanding the cost of all of this, right? Because it's a business proposition. So how do you still make money and profit at the end of the day? Uh, how reliable does it have to be for you to still make money for your applications? Uh, it, so it's combining reliability physics from bottom up with uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence system level, artificial intelligence information from the other end. So we have to use these digital twins to uh, connect the dots between those two bodies of approach, uh, those two approaches. These are just the various application domains that the HI roadmap has to uh, has to uh, deal with. Right. So that's it. That's my last box over there. The goal is to be able to design chiplet-based ba chiplet HI systems that are intelligent, self-cognizant, resilient, and perhaps self to have some degree of self repair or self healing capabilities to serve reliable, uh, reliably through the life cycle, expected life cycle. Yeah. Greg, I'm going to stop over there. Uh, OK. Yeah. So I've um, uh, got uh, several questions here, but let me just uh, start with uh, um, focusing on the reliability of the final joint. You know, What supply chain challenges do you see for the market uh, when you have these direct bonded you know, wafer to wafer uh, versus, you know, solder bump based uh, chiplet assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, the technology is, of course, very different, direct bonded versus solder, to, uh, solder bonded, and the processes are different. The, uh, so therefore, what kinds of process driven stresses you have exposed the rest of the system to are very different. So that itself is a challenge, right? The system has to survive your processing stresses. And then the material suppliers that you're dealing with in the solder world is very different from the material suppliers you're dealing with in the direct bonded systems. So uh, uh, what th those different communities, material supply communities understand in terms of material properties and which material properties are gonna be important to your reliability, that level of understanding, unfortunately, is very different today. So trying to bring everyone to the same page has been a huge supply chain challenge for us for these different kinds of bonding technologies. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's also a lot of commonality, right? You're talking about life cycle stresses that are going to act over the lifetime of these joints. And these joints have to carry this uh, thermomechanical stresses, in a few cases, just pure mechanical stresses, uh, uh, and electrical. So there's going to be current densities, which means there's electro migration of material, right? Also thermal migration of materials. Solders have very different characteristics from copper. Uh, so they're going to react very differently to those electrical stresses and thermal stresses. So there is bo body of knowledge to handle all of that. But the models and the model constants and the ways to deal with it and the tools to deal with it are very, very different. 
Okay. Um, should we perform high temperature operating life burn-in testing for reliability at the chiplet level? You know, can you highlight the pros and cons of doing reliability test at the system level versus chiplet level? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's always been a challenge. Uh, here's the thing: you cannot do uh, well. Let's take the two extremes of that, right? You cannot say, "Oh, I'm not going to do anything at the subsystem level. I'll wait till my entire system is." Uh, built up, and then I'll do my reliability testing uh, so that I capture all of my subsystems, the weaknesses of all of my subsystems, all the interactions between the subsystems, everything, the whole bowl of wax, and I'll do all of my design of the, uh, testing at the end. Well, the obvious problem with that is if you do get some failures, how do you root cause it back down when you've got such a complex system? First off, how do you even monitor for degradation for subs of each of the subsystems in there. And second, when you do get failures, how do you root cause it back? It's a almost unmanageable task as the system gets beyond a certain level of complexity, root causing it back is a almost unmanageable task. And the root causing is critical, of course, because that's how you're gonna go back and ruggedize your system, understand what the failure mechanism was so you have the right reliability model to extrapolate that to field conditions and so on. So, the comp system complexity gets you if you wait till the very end. The other extreme is, well, I'm gonna test at every level of my design and every level of my assembly, right? Uh, there the problem becomes, uh, how many times are you gonna retest that same system, subsystem as it goes through the assembly process? How many stress exposures is it gonna see? If, if every part of your supply chain is gonna keep testing and retesting and retesting as it goes up the chain. And number two, uh, it doesn't have all the interactions with the rest of the subsystem, right? If I'm testing one subsystem in a larger module, all of the thermal expansion mismatches, all of the mechanical warpage mismatches, all of the uh, electrical uh, uh, stresses that the rest of the system is gonna put on this, uh, all of the harsh chemicals it'll get exposed to from the rest of uh, process chemicals of the rest of the system, all of those interactions, from a, and when I say interactions, I mean they're not circuit design, I mean from a uh, reliability perspective, all of those interactions are missing if I test just one module at a time. So clearly, neither extreme is quite doable and trying to find that sweet spot at, okay, at how many different levels am I gonna retest the system as it goes through the assembly process uh, is almost an art today. We don't have a very good ability to quantitatively optimize that process. Uh, I mentioned the uh, term called knowledge-based testing that uh, Shubhada uses from, uh, sorry, that Intel uses quite a bit. So that is really an attempt to try to do that kind of application-based uh, optimization of how do you test a system. And that includes at how many different levels am I going to test the subsystems ultimately to ensure that when it's all put together, the end system will perform satisfactorily. So I wish I had a clear answer for the person who posed this question. It's an excellent question, but today it's still a bit of an art. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question we had was, uh, what are the key challenges to increase the density of chips on the package and reduce die spacing? And in this case, one of your co-presenters, uh, Rob Munoz, volunteered to answer that. Oh, wonderful. I'm going to defer to him. It uh, okay. seems to be an architecture design question, so I think... Uh, Sure. And I, I'll freely admit I messed up. I hit the wrong button. I was hoping to type an answer because there's probably other uh, panelists that would also like to weigh in. But I mean, there's, you know, key thing for getting things spaced closely together is obviously the packaging technology, right? Where if you, especially if you can use 3D packaging, you can get things really close together. But then there's other challenges in terms of thermals, power delivery, all mm -hmm. those kinds of yeah. things that were already mentioned. Now, uh, even with a you know 2.5D type thing like EMIB or uh, silicon interposer type things, you can get things very close together. Uh, of course, you have to be cognizant of the tiling overheads that I mentioned earlier in terms of the die-to-die -die communication uh, type things, because that's going to um, you know, increase the effective um, distance or density into which you can pack things together. I'm sure other panelists may have additional insights and opinions uh, there. I just wanted to get the conversation started, but unfortunately I hit the wrong button. Okay. 
Uh, I, I, I think I'll just pick up on that response, just one aspect of that response that I'm qualified to speak on, and that was the thermal part. So that's a very key aspect as you get to a denser and denser packaging. Uh, getting all the heat out is absolutely a nightmare sometimes. So uh, that has direct implications on reliability, well, performance and reliability. So my group worries a lot about those aspects. Uh, there's also, of course, as feature sizes get smaller and smaller, as I mentioned, you're getting down to length scales of material defects, intrinsic material defects. And again, the performance uh, and the reliability poses very unique challenges when you get down to those length scales. I'll stop over there. Okay. If there aren't any other comments there, I, I think we're probably time for one last question and then I'll Ira wrap things up. But the, the question is, reliable systems in package need known good dyes. We've heard other comments on challenges in known good dye, but what are your thoughts on the KGD impact of reliability over lifetime of the product? Right. So uh, I think as the dyes get more and more complex, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, there are people better qualified than me to speak over here, of course, we're no longer looking for zero defects, right? So a known good dye today is not one that necessarily boasts zero defects. We do allow a certain amount of uh, defects. It's just that the system design has to be resilient enough to uh, deal with it, deal with the uh, presence of some degree of defects. Uh, that is true even in chipless based based systems. You are going to have to live with systems that have, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, partial performance. They're not all performing 100%. They're performing partially, maybe 90%. And the design has to be able to deal with that and, and uh, take that into account. I'm going to return this, actually punt this question over now to some of maybe Robert, since you talked about architecture, design architecture. How do you deal with uh, this uh, concept of non good time? Yeah, I'm sure other panelists would also want to weigh in, but of course things are in some sense easier when things are being integrated, all come from the same company, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I think there were some other panelists who had some, some great points on this already, but it's getting things tested so that you have high confidence that things are good. Of course, it's never going to be 100% is very important as well as the uh, reliability of your associated uh, packaging is assembly and test, as I mentioned earlier. So other panelists, I'm sure, can can weigh in as well. Maybe not. Okay. Maybe not. Yes. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, in the uh, Chiplet packaging technology, we've got two and a half, 3D, other approaches. Um, what are the increases in reliability concerns over just the wafer level processing? Right. You know, as we go to seven nanometer, five nanometer, you mentioned gate all around right. other advanced technologies. Right. So, uh, yeah, and that's the whole point uh, that now in a chiplet based systems, so you're doing a lot of additional. Uh, packaging that's now part of your chiplet itself, right? It's, uh, so there's a convergence now of additional packaging back end of the line processes that typically are well beyond just the gate concerns about the gates and the semiconductor. So uh, that's really where the heterogeneous integration is taking us is now the same company that was worrying just initially just about the semiconductor and someone else is worrying about the packaging. Now that's no longer two separate companies, it's all converging into the same co-design step. And you have to worry about a many more number of failure, potential failure and degradation mechanisms than just your uh, gate, FinFET or gate all around or whichever node you're using. Uh, apart from that, you also have to worry about what the rest of the packaging does to your semiconductor performance. So uh, it, it seems like successful deployment of chiplets requires a significant increase in the complexity around the understanding of, of dealing with reliability in these heterogeneous systems. Uh, do you feel like the industry broadly is addressing this uh, effectively? You know, where are the biggest gaps remaining? Very good question. Uh, 
again, I don't think necessarily that we are dealing with new knowledge that we didn't have. Uh, well, to some extent we are, I'll come to that. But the point is that we are really talking about combining bodies of knowledge that existed in different parts of the supply chain. Uh, all of that is now collapsing or converging into the same level of manufacturer or same level of supply chain. Uh, uh, and that is where the, the term integration in HI comes from that. We are integrating multiple steps into the same step over here. Uh, so it's really combining different bodies of knowledge now at a common level. And of course, the, there's also this issue of now the, the interactions, because we are packaging at multiple levels now, the interaction stresses are now very, very different. The kinds of warpages we deal with, the kinds of thermal mechanical stresses we deal with uh, are qu quite more complex, uh, apart from the fact that also our length scales have all dramatically increased, decreased for interconnect substrates, die, uh, uh, die features for everything. So all of those are playing a, uh, uh, collaboratively playing a role on uh, how we have to package this knowledge. Uh, but I would say that, yes, there are knowledgeable people in that knowledge ecosystem. And those are the people that we are trying to tap in this HI Roadmap team that Bill and Ravi and uh, Bill Bottoms, the, all of them have been harnessing the, those teams from all over the world, literally. And maybe Ravi can speak a little bit more about that. And that's what the purpose of that roadmap is, is uh, because that roadmap is what's going to drive, as you saw, uh, come, uh, and I'll speak just within my domain, talk about, let's say, design for reliability, right? The ancestors of this world, the mentor graphics of this world. They are creating these tools to make these kinds of complex multi-package, uh, multi-level packaging that you need now within your triplet-based systems. They're creating those integrated seamless tools because of, in part, uh, these roadmaps that are being created and that are pointing to that specific need. It's not that they're starting from zero. They were doing a lot of this at different length scales, different material systems, and with discrete tools. Now they are trying to combine all of them into combined tools for code design and also uh, capturing knowledge for new material systems and at, at new length scales that are becoming important for these modern systems. Uh, Ravi, do you want to speak a little bit about that? Actually, I'd, I'd like to compliment what you said. And there's a question from Tom in the Q&A as well. Uh -huh. You know, models are as good as the val uh, as good as the validation that yeah. in them yeah. and the quality of the metrologies that show up. And Tom talked about the inline metrologies. I also think validation metrologies is something we ought to bolster up a little bit in our roadmaps. Mm -hmm. But together, I think you're right. The, the core design and simulation is coming together quite well. Maybe not as fast as you would like, but it is coming together mm -hmm. quite well. Yeah, and and uh, I'm glad uh, you mentioned that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'll take a second here. I'm glad you mentioned model validation, because uh, yes, the question <laughs> was correct and Ravi's response was correct. A model is only as good as uh, the calibration, right? And the validation. Uh, as we all know, any modeling, garbage in, garbage out, so unless your model is based on realistic uh, processes or realistic physics and calibrated model constants, uh, you're, you're out of luck. Right. Okay. I think we need to let Ira wrap things up now. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Abjit. Uh, excellent presentation, uh, fantastic discussion. I can actually see uh, the possibility we might want to do a a uh, whole workshop on reliability as part of the road to chiplets because really it is far more complex with two uh, with significantly more players across mm -hmm. multiple yeah. domains yeah. than the monolithic approach so thank you for an excellent presentation greg thank you for uh, moderating today and i'd like to thank all the presenters but lastly i'd like to thank once again our sponsors adventist Amcor, and synopsis who made this event possible um, adventist uh, rated the best ate company 2021 in the vlsi research uh, supplier uh, survey uh, for customer satisfaction uh, Amcor leading osat with differentiators in technology, quality, and services, and synopsis of uh, providing solutions from silicon to software. So I uh, thank them. I thank all of you for attending. 
And uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future MEPTEC event uh, soon in person, but we'll also continue the virtual format because uh, it's great to have such a wide variety of speakers and attendees. So thank you all and have a good rest of your day.